All right, so once again, I decided to just do this all in one lecture rather than split it up into three little ones so you can bite off as much as you want. Um, but this is to go along with the um, video lectures. And there's just one long video lecture as well, but there's three in class or video lecture quizzes that you need to take. So I'm going to cover some things which are also covered in the video lecture just in a little bit more detail. All right, so a few of the things to keep in mind. We've got the final draft of your projects due on the 27th. I believe the rough drafts um, are due on the 20th. Um, this is the last unit, humans and the sea, the last unit. So uh, there will be a discussion and uh, a exam posted and, and then you just have to work on your paper and your project which is to record your presentation. Um, so make a PowerPoint and do a video recording of you presenting or of um, your voice over the slides, whatever you prefer. And if you are in a group, then you can decide how you're gonna do that, whether you're gonna do half of it and have someone else do half of it and both turn it in. There's a rubric on the syllabus as well or on the home page in Canvas or how you read graded for that as well. There is a another uh, assignment which we have, which is watch a documentary and write a three-page paper. Um, this is to replace one of the assignments we had on the field trip. So this is worth a hundred points. Um, there's again directions on the homepage or on the syllabus. So check that out for the rubric on how it'll be graded. Um, basically just want you to find a marine biology documentary and relate it to the course. There are lots of them available. There are many of free ones available as well. You can get some at your library if they're open, which they probably aren't. Um, but let me know if you're having trouble finding one, but it should be relatively easy. Um, and then we have one other thing. We have a quiz. Uh, based on the species that the 175 students have made into a field guide. Um, that you'll, we'll have more details forthcoming as we compile all the things and put it in a document and then have you guys um, take a quiz on that. So other than these three things, that's the only other thing in the course. So should be winding down now, um, hopefully, or ramping up, however you want to see it, but the end is near. All right, so these are things we're going to go um, through, starting with growth rates of populations and maximum sustainable yield. Very. So um, there are two different ways in which most populations of organisms grow. All right, the first one um, is... called exponential growth and this is not unique to populations but lots of things can grow exponentially essentially it's it's growing without any restriction right so what it looks like when things grow exponentially is it's a sharp j curve so if you look at infection rates of covid-19 generally they follow this pattern um, after a country is first exposed or someone who is exposed is first comes to the country you have a few and then it starts to gain steam and eventually it's it takes over um so this is an r-shaped or sorry j-shaped curve and what we have on the x-axis then on the y-axis we have population so the total Um, number, uh, this is abbreviated as N, so the total population of an organism. On the x-axis, then you have um, time. So essentially, over time, population grows and grows and grows and grows. Well, not everything can grow exponentially. There are things that can, for a short period of time, grow exponentially, but most things grow with some sort of inhibition. And uh, generally, there is some sort of 
limit to their population, and we call that then, and we're going to represent this by this dotted line, K, which is the carrying capacity. And we've got time on the x-axis there, okay? Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, well. All right. So here's your J-shaped exponential curve. Um, in exponential growth, you have things that are limiting the uh, ability of the population to grow. And generally, this is resources in the environment, but also might be interactions with other organisms, such as competition or predation or things like that. Um, so the beginning of the graph over time is, is very similar to the exponential growth. But at a certain point, those factors start to become more and more important as you get more a greater population competition is greater perhaps predation is greater interactions with the environment are greater and so rather than having a j-shaped curve you have this s-shaped curve and it's not a perfect s obviously um with well, this is called uh, logistic growth And when you model this, as you get closer and closer to the carrying capacity, the growth rate decreases. But at some point, you have um, exponential growth, right, down in this area. This is essentially exponential growth. And where this line is the steepest is where you have uh, really a, um, the greatest growth rate. And there is a point at the middle here. This is called the inflection point. All right, and at this point, this is where the growth rate starts to change, where it's pretty much exponential up to that point. After that, you have these density dependent factors which are going to decrease that growth rate. Now, why is this important? Well, because if you are, um, let's say, fishing this represents the population of flounder that you are fishing um, the rate at which you can um, fully increase or replace the population after harvest is going to be you know somewhere in this area somewhere near the inflection point where you have the greatest growth rate and you want that because you want species to be able to rebound and reproduce um, as fast as possible. Um, but you don't really want to go below the inflection point because if you do that every year, the population is going to continually decrease. If you can stay above the inflection point, then the population will stay at a more stable or... Um, it may increase and then you harvest every year. So this is the ideal. Is the harvest, you take it back close to the inflection point um, and it has the greater, greatest amount, greatest ability to rebound after that, okay? Now we call, generally this inflection point is the carrying capacity divided by two. And that gives us the maximum sustainable yield. So if we can keep the population at half of the carrying capacity, so let's say the carrying capacity is 1 million fish, then we will keep the population at 500,000 each year. And let's say if we harvest at 5,000, um, each year it will replace itself, or sorry, 500,000, each year will replace itself with 200,000, then we would be able to take 200,000 every year 
and it would have a stable population and it would be maximizing its increase and we'd be maximizing our sustainable yield. So that is generally the practice that most uh, fisheries want to achieve is the maximum sustainable yield. However, there's, it is very difficult to get maximum sustainable yield because for one, one reason, populations are not stable from year to year. Right? So you may have weather events. Um, you may have ecological interactions. You may have, you know, different breeding events. Um, which are going to make this population not be smooth, but actually uh, a bit unpredictable. Unpredictable. And so, finding the actual amount you can harvest is very hard. Um, also, if you um, if you guess wrong, right? If you um, overshoot maximum sustainable yield well then you get this case going on right you're gonna deplete your stocks um and then you know generally some fisheries get greedy and they just want to get as much as they can out of the the stock while it's there and so it, it becomes very difficult to actually um sustainably maximize your take every year all right, and one of the uh, problems with some fisheries is that they are somewhat unregulated. And this is related, uh, this is a phenomenon which is very common. You've probably heard this before called the tragedy of the commons. And this is essentially an allegory to show resource use. And, and the, 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 the story goes like this. Uh, you have essentially the Lord of the area living in his castle right big doors here right mm -mm -mm. and he um declares where these peasants can graze their cattle right oops okay so if i want to move this guy what do i do Anyway, all right, and so um, peasant one is given this land, peasant two is given this land, peasant three is given this land, all right, and uh, they have then their um, incentive to take care of their land, because that's the land that they're given. If they overrun it with sheep, they'll deplete it and they won't be able to take more but there's another area area four here and this is called the commons all right and so the king in his castle says um i will allow anyone to use the commons as much as they want well now surf one two and three um realize that if they take their sheep into the commons then they don't have to worry about uh, depleting their own land. And um, so they'll start to use the commons. Well, Surf 1 and 2 then realizes uh, that Surf 3 is using the commons, and they want some free goods as well. And so they'll start, oops, they'll start grazing in that area as well so that they can also get some, some free benefit. And what that does is it makes the commons um, overgrazed to the point where all the um, all the grass is eaten and nothing is left but dirt. And so the commons essentially becomes wasted, becomes a wasteland. I need a color of brownness. 
All right, so there's nothing but dirt here now, nothing can graze. And we call that the tragedy, okay? The tragedy is that when you leave something to be unregulated and open, people are going to rush in and use the resource as quickly as possible because they all realize that it's going, only going to be there temporarily. So a fishing um, stock can also be, uh, if it's unregulated, be treated as a commons. And it will be depleted if no one is there to manage it. And some stocks are like that. All right, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is a updated version of some of the information that you had on the video lecture. Um, insights in the state of the world of fisheries and aquaculture. So some of the statistics here are similar but different. So nearly 14, uh, uh, 60 million people were directly employed in fisheries and aquaculture. And this is looking at in, in the world. Some of the other statistics, um, fish supplies 50% or more of people's protein intake in these uh, countries here. Um, you have, um, there's another statistic somewhere, 17% of all animal protein is consumed by the global population as fish. Um, that's a little lower than the numbers given in your book. Um, and so anyway, uh, I just put this on here so you guys could see that what the information that you have uh, in the book and in the video lecture is uh, a little outdated. Uh, but still, the underlying message is that fish is very important for food for uh, many parts of the world. Um, it also gives some me, statistics about those countries that are um, more involved in the fisheries than others. All right, so one of the um, fishery stocks that I wanted to highlight was sharks. And sharks have been the victim of another, um, I guess, illegal, legal uh, market for something that is that, that seems a little bit useless. All right, so... Uh, there's like traditional herbal medicines in some countries such as uh, rhino horn, right? Which has led to the decimation of rhinos, even though it, you know, rhino horn is no different than like toenails. So uh, this, these sort of things just don't make sense. And with sharks, what it's been is a shark fin soup, which is a delicacy um, in many Asian countries and what they, what a shark finner will do is they'll, they'll catch these sharks. They'll just take off the fins and then they'll throw the rest of the shark either back in the ocean or they'll chop it up and, and use it as like fish bait. Um, but the actual part of the animal that is used is very little and I watched uh, see Dave Ramsey do a show about shark fin soup, and he actually tasted it, and he said it's really not much different than ham soup, and uh, and and so he found it not too much different in taste than just like a ham soup, uh, and so it's a it's a little bit pointless as to why this is continuing, but that and other fishing pressures have led to the continual decrease in a lot of shark species. The great white shark down 92% from stocks from the 1960. Uh, the tiger shark down 74%. Whaler sharks 82, 92. And if you went further back, those percentages would be even higher. Basically, sharks are, for the most part, missing from our oceans. And they are a very important part of the ocean because they are a top predator. So they're going to bring balance to the ecosystems that other um, organisms just won't be able to. So we, we need to preserve sharks. The killing of them, for at least for shark fin soup, is pretty much senseless. And another th thing about sharks is they are very hard to rebound because they are what is called a case strategist. So case strategists uh, generally are long-lived, which is good. That would, that'll help us. 
but they have late sexual maturity, similar to the, the cod. They generally have very few young. Um, and have parental care, although sharks don't have uh, parental care. Um, and so their ability to rebound because of these characteristics um they're they're generally competitive right so and they are hardy in their environment which are good things and they're long lived but because it takes a while for them to reproduce and they don't produce very much it's going to take them a long time to recover uh and and so a lot of restrictions need to be in place regarding sharks they're also uh, can be a big um, bycatch casualty, right? Remember, bycatch is the stuff that they catch that is unintentional, but they end up dying as well. So dolphins can be by, a bycatch of um, tuna catches. Um, so anyway, sharks are depleted considerably they're gonna have a really hard time rebounding unless there's a lot of measures in place for a really long time and they're very important to the ecosystem because they are a top predator and bring balance to the ecosystem all right well one of the things which may bring a little more balance to the uh, fishing industry is aquaculture all right so the pros to the aquaculture is it's much more concentrated in its ability to uh make large quantities of food, large quantities of, of fish. Okay, it can also be regulated. Uh, it does not affect, generally, natural stocks of fish. Um, it can generally be done pretty cheap. Um, and so aquaculture has replaced a lot of the um, actual going out and fishing in, in many fishing industries. Um, there are some downsides, however. Uh, cons include it's going to replace or replenish um, vital ecosystems such as mangroves. All right, um, which isn't good because mangroves are very important for marine ecosystems. Um, they lead to a lot of pollution. Uh, they can lead to a lot of disease. That disease can then spread to natural stocks. Um, and it can be a means for um, releasing invasive fish into an area. So aquaculture, uh, again, is something that needs these things need to be addressed these cons before it can be thought of as a, a great solution towards the uh, depleting of fish stocks all right so switching gears off of fishing onto um, energy we do require uh, or can get a lot of energy from the sea the number one way we do that is through offshore drilling so there are areas in the ocean, um, well, below the ocean floor, where there are large reserves of oil, and we can tap those. Um, but one of the problems is when we do that, uh, inevitably there become some mistakes that are made and oil spills that, are, that happen, include the Exxon Valdez oil spill, um, and then the Deep Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Exxon Valdez was in Alaska. Both of them were devastating in their ecological consequences of, of not only just the plants and animals and things that live there, but also the fisheries and that are in the area. So, um, but it is something that is present. There are plenty of other areas which could be explored and um, more oil could be extracted. However, the, 
this should probably be done with caution because the more drilling you do, the more um, opportunities for accidents, which can be devastating to the ecosystem. There are some cool things which I think should be pursued more. One is offshore wind farms. What's nice about these is that they can um, gather energy in areas which are reduce a lot of the negatives where they're normally put. So they're normally put on land, on mountains and things, but these would be out of sight. So you don't have to worry about the eyesore. They would also be, um, oops. They would also be out of uh, wildlife at least uh, aerial wildlife. So a lot less things fly over the ocean than they do over the land. And so you're not, not going to kill bats and birds as much. Um, and hopefully underneath it could be done to be uh, a lot less harmless as well. But that's yet to be seen. Another way you can get energy out of the ocean is through uh, using the tides. Okay, so you can create turbo generators just like these that which are spin with the wind that actually would spin as the tide comes in and out. And that can be a form of electricity. What's great about that is it's renewable, just like the wind. Uh, the tides are going to constantly come in and out every day. And so basically you have a infinite uh, source of energy um, as long as you put these uh, turbo generators in the right area. Okay, so those are forms of energy which we can uh, extract from the ocean. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is eutrophication and bioaccumulation. All right, so in a normal healthy ecosystem, okay, uh, you have, uh, this is a river delta which then leads to uh, the ocean, All right? And you have, uh, let's see, let's get a green here. What you have is you have levels of, so once this gets to the ocean, you have phytoplankton, right? Which are photosynthesizers. Um, they're eaten by little zooplankton like shrimps. These are little shrimps eating them, yay. All right, and under the under the water, you're gonna have uh, sea grasses, right? And then you're gonna have big, beautiful fish, which are gonna be eating the phytoplankton, right? That's a fishy here, and you'll have a a, a nice, healthy ecosystem with multiple trophic levels. Um, in eutrophication, what happens is you have these farms, right? These rows and rows of farms. They're growing soybeans. They're growing corn. And what they're doing is they are putting loads and loads of fertilizer on their... Um, on their uh, fields, right? Since so they want it to grow and it grows a lot. Well, not all of that will go into the ground and be absorbed by the plants. Some of it will run off into the rivers and streams, right? And uh, all of that will concentrate then at these areas where the rivers meet the ocean. Um, and what you'll get then is these uh, phytoplankton, which is mostly algae, will now have tons and tons of nutrients. So rather than just being a small part of the ecosystem, you get these algae blooms. Okay, and now they've got way... Um, they are not limited by any nutrients. And what that does is it makes it so these algae all over the place, all right, they eat up all the oxygen. Now, I don't mean by eat, but use up oxygen. 
And then they also create this basically thick blanket which blocks sunlight. Mommy. Okay, and normally you would have zooplankton eating your phytoplankton and then fish eating that, but because there's no oxygen in there, uh, the little fish, okay, and the zooplankton, um, well, they can't survive in that, and so they die, all right? And then because these the uh, sea grasses are below um, the water, they also will die. And what you get is just algae, algae uh, growing out of control. Um, and sometimes these algaes can also secrete toxins, which uh, will cause uh, marine mammals and other animals um, to um, die and, and exhibit pathological conditions. So this is called eutrophication because you means one or true. Uh, essentially, it only allows one thing to, to grow, and that's algae, instead of a um, very trophic um, level of um, organisms in the ecosystem. Okay, so also having to do with trophic um, levels, bioaccumulation... Um, starts where you have a certain amount of elements in the ocean. So let's say uh, this brown represents the level of uh, silver. Uh, no, let's not do silver. Let's do mercury, which I think is... I can't remember what this sign is for mer Mercury. We'll just say Mercury. All right, which is a heavy metal, which can cause lots of problems um, physiologically for organisms. Now, you've got phytoplankton, which live in the ocean, and they're going to um, have a certain amount of biomass. All right, so you've got your phytoplankton. And they're going to accumulate some of this mercury in their tissues. Not a lot. Okay? And they don't live very long, so it doesn't really affect them. But our, our zooplankton, there's not as many of them as the phytoplankton. But they will eat the uh, phytoplankton. And let's say this zooplankton eats five phytoplankton in its life. All right, well, now it's going to have each of those five particles of mercury in its body, whatever it is. And so it's accumulated more mercury than the phytoplankton did, right? Well, the next level... Let's say are your small fish. And let's say it eats five of these zooplankton. And each of those zooplankton had five mercuries in it. So now it has. 25 mercuries inside of it. Now, maybe even 25 isn't bad for a fish to have. Let's say 25. It can still physiologically be just fine. But let's say you go to the next level. Now you have this huge fish, all right? And it eats five of these other fish. And so now this one has 125 little mercuries inside of it. And now, at some point, it's going to cause physiological problems, right? Well, what if you and I then eat this fish? Then we're going to have tons of mercury going inside of it. And mercury doesn't go away. It accumulates in the tissues and stays there. And so it can cause then 
lots of problems. So mercury, uh, DDT, other heavy metals, these are subject to bioaccumulation, which is bad. So these are things that we don't want to be in our water because it accumulates over time in the trophic levels. And, uh, and we should also be wary of how much of these larger fish that we eat, how much seafood we eat in general, because we could be ingesting a lot of these uh, chemicals into our, <laughs> into our body's tissues, which can cut, give us problems as well. Okay, guys, that's it for uh, Humans in the Sea. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Good luck.